So I'm Robert Hormuth. I'm a corporate vice president of the Data Center Solutions Group Architecture and Strategy Team. So at AMD and our Data Center Solutions Group, um, this is where the Epic CPU um, comes from. This is where the Pensando DPU and our networking technology comes from. And we have a very tight uh, relationship with our Data Center GPU products as, as well. Um, a little bit about, about me real quick. Um, I'm relatively new to AMD, about just approaching three years. Um, started out with a team of one and we've hired some of the yahoos that you'll you'll get to hear from later today over the last two and a half years. I think we've put about 30 in this team or 25, 30 something in this architecture and strategy team. And uh, prior to AMD, I was at Dell for 13 years. Uh, I was CTO of the server PowerEdge BU. Um, prior to that, I did a, a stint, a uh, nine, eight, eight, nine year stint at Intel and uh, started my career at National Instruments. Um, back in the uh, late 80s, I guess, um, doing all kinds of uh, stuff back then that we just called embedded computing that the marketeers are happy to call IoT and Edge now. Um, but we used to do all kinds of test and measurement, machine vision control, motor control, so all kinds of fun stuff, including x86 embedded systems, which kind of led me to Intel and Dell and to, to AMD. So what I'm going to talk about today and really just kind of set up a little bit for the real stars of the show, Chuck and Jason back there, is some of the things that we're doing that we see happening in the modern data center and some of the tooling that we're doing to try and make it easier. So the, uh, the first step, let me see, uh, we'll skip the, uh, the, the first step that I want to kind of talk about is just the way we view the future of computing. And so we take, we step back and, and try and branch predict what we think is going on today and how things are going to evolve tomorrow. And, and this is, you know, a little bit of maybe mom and op apple pie a little bit, but, you know, when we look at it and we look at, you know, the, the deeper perception of humanity, computing going everywhere, computing being used in all kinds of ways of our lives to, you know, the, the advent of, of supercomputing and higher performance, you know, we're being able to simulate things that we never thought we could. Um, you know, AI is, you know, if you haven't heard, it's kind of a buzzword now. Um, <laughs> you know, clearly it's going to, you know, we're at the early stages. Um, but I have a, you know, a different perspective maybe that, you know, in the future of AI, my, my belief today is, you know, we're kind of in this stage of a big brother. You know, AI is very much being used to influence humans, to buy, click, watch, recommend, um, you know, chat GPT is starting to move us into more of the human assistance era, which I call kind of the big mother era. Mothers are caring, nurturing, and, you know, and there's going to be a whole new wave. I, I believe there's a whole new wave of AI beyond the big brother that we're just very, you know, just touching, you know, that's going to be on that human assistance side, not just the human influence side. And so I think that the hockey stick is going to go, you know, really fast. Um, and that gets into, you know, enhancing the user experiences, you know, businesses are using more and more of these tools and technologies to, to drive business results and outcomes. You know, IT is no longer just a factory to keep the lights on. Um, you can't go anywhere in any company today without talking about sustainability and energy efficiency. It's going to become even more important. Um, you know, if you look at some of the big colos, if you've been monitoring like the percentage of colos, and what capacity they have, you know, they're down to like all time lows in terms of capacity. And that just shows you the demand for, for compute and high performance and, and um, you know, the generative AI or AI of the future. And of course we've got, you know, use cases, new use cases that we haven't thought about. This whole idea of subscription economy and institutional disaggregation. Um, this is just the whole notion of, you know, Lyft, Airbnb, Uber, you know, the middleman in the middle removal. And we're going to see that in more and more industries. And of course, you can't go anywhere without the data and sovereignty rules that are being applied across countries, cities, states, villages. I happen to live in a village, not a city. Um, that's a longer, longer story in Texas, but we're, we're a village, um, not, a, not a city. And so all these domains are going to have different rules and privacy laws. And that's setting up, you know, a need for technology of the future. And it's a pretty simple recipe for how do we get there? You know, high performance computing is absolutely going to be required. Efficiency is going to be required off the chart. You know, and optimized architectures are more and more 
um, being used and have to be used. The only way we can change the per, per watt equation and the performance per dollar equation is if we start to use more homogeneous or more heterogeneous compute that are really optimized for their, you know, for their intended uses and couple that with the software security and networking. These are the big themes that are driving forward to enable those next generation use cases. And just by, by way of example, if you look at you know, some of the data, the compute performance and memory demands, you know, in AI compute, the, you know, we're doubling, the demand for AI computes doubling about every 3.4 months or so. Uh, just enormous, right? And if we just, if we just followed Moore's law, you know, um, you know, we're gonna be way behind doubling every 24 months. We're just way behind if we stayed with the tried and true. We look at the leading supercomputers, um, you know, doubling every, you know, 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3 years or so. You know, if you look at what Frontier, what we launched with Frontier last year, and you look at what we're deploying with El Capitan later this year, um, you know, we're going to stay on that trajectory. Um, now, the power is, is going up, um, no doubt, but the performance per watt and efficiency is, is, is staying very, very good because we're moving to a very good heterogeneous architecture. And then the demands on the memory subsystem, you know, we're, we're an industry that goes back and forth. Is it the network, the bottleneck? Is it the compute, the bottleneck? Or is it the memory, the bottleneck? You know, we're in an era of, of memory being the bottleneck, especially fast access memory for some of these large models. And so, you know, for AMD, we believe strongly that the future is going to be heterogeneous. Um, I know we've, you know, the world's, we've only been talking about heterogeneous compute in the data center for, I don't know, 20, 30 years now. Um, you know, is it finally here? I think, you know, on the AI front, it definitely would, would say it's here. Um, and so, you know, at AMD, we've got a whole breadth of, you know, compute elements from your best general purpose to our adaptive SOCs with FPGAs to our accelerators like Pensando um, on the DPU front to compute with Instinct to custom SOCs. Um, you know, we're one of the leading providers in, in the, uh, the game consoles that are very custom adaptive, highly optimized devices all the way down to, to ASICs. We have a growing business that we call S3, uh, so, uh, what is it, Silicon, uh, custom silicon solutions, where we, we build custom chips for people. They come to us, we've got a portfolio of IP, um, we will build a chip for you if you come with your checkbook, um, you know, and want to buy a lot of units. So that's a fast growing business and it allows us to leverage all the IP from AMD's, you know, x86, from our Instinct line, from all the IP that came in the house from Xilinx, the IP that came in from Hasando. So it sets us up really well to have this broad, you know, specialized to adaptive uh, uh, approach. And so, you know, at AMD, what we're trying to do is address all these challenges from general purpose IT. You know, we've got lots of world records. I think that's, we, we've been pretty public on that. Um, one of the things that Chuck and Jason are gonna talk about is how do we ease the migration? You know, one of the things that we talk about on my team all the time is how do we ease high core count adoption? That's a strategic differentiation advantage that we have. And our charter, part of our charter on the team is how do we ease that? So making software seamless, making migration seamless is one of those things that we strive for. You know, the energy efficiency that we're, we're leading the, the industry in performance per watt, if you look at any kind of spec power metric known to man, um, you know, we lead in every spec power, you know, almost two X over the, the best that the competition can deliver. And we've gone through a, you know, there's been a major milestone. I don't know if you've noticed, but in, in terms of like performance efficiency for the first time in history, a one socket is now just as energy efficient as a two socket. It used to be one socket always lagged behind. It couldn't quite close that gap. Um, but because of the, the epic architectures that we have and the scaling, um, there is no energy efficiency trade-off between one and two P anymore. If you go look at the, the latest spec scores, I think the, the best 2P is like um, 30,000 something SSJ ops a watt and the best 1P is like 29.6. I call that practically even. Um, you know, the, the competition is sitting around, I don't know, 15, 16K. Um, so we've got a huge energy efficiency lead on both 1 and 2P, trying to drive that energy efficiency. And then we throw in the optimized workloads with what we're doing with HPC with Epic with Instinct. If you look at Frontier, um, Frontier is basically a, a Milan CPU and an Epic GPU, um, you know, with an, an Infinity Fabric connected in between. 
you know, in a four to one uh, kind of ratio. So it's a, you know, it's the precursor to the APU. If you look at Frontier, you could basically say Frontier is a discrete APU, the way that we implemented it between the CPU and the GPU with the Infinity Fabric. And then, you know, we've been aiming, you know, again, we talked about the rise of data analytics and big data applications. This is why we're driving both the 2P and 1P big memory. Um, and then, you know, the other part of our portfolio that we're trying to solve, again, on that optimized workload is down on the electronic trading side. One of the, one of the great IP assets that we acquired through Xilinx that had acquired SolarFlare was a leading, you know, low latency NIC on Wall Street. So if you look at any of the electronic traders, um, underneath the hood, you will find a SolarFlare adapter today and tomorrow and hopefully the day after that that are all using that specialized low latency NIC for their electronic trading needs. Um, and so, you know, getting then into what we, you know, a big discussion is the AI front. And, you know, what we've been working on is a consistent, you know, AI portfolio across AMD. And so what, we, what we've done so far, you know, on the AI front is we've introduced one of the, one of the IPs that we picked up from Xilinx was the AIE. So they had this AI acceleration engine super optimized for inference. And we brought that IP, the first thing we did was we popped it in Ryzen. So in the Ryzen mobile, Ryzen desktop, you can get a, an AMD CPU with an optimized accelerator that is by far the best performance per watt inference accelerator in a mobile SOC. And that'll deliver next generation, you know, end user consumer experiences. Um, we've got those same AIEs in some of our embedded versatile um, SOCs that are being used in all kinds of edge to telco, to medical instruments. Um, we've got, you know, we, we can support with our Zend in and Studio. We support all the AI frameworks in our Epic. We've got the Alveo, and then we've got the AMD Instinct accelerators that are on a similar journey to Epic. Um, you know, if you look at the Epic journey from Naples, it's kind of a crawl, walk, run. Get a credible architecture, get back in the market, get the ecosystem going, get high performance, and drive leadership. Uh, Instinct is on that same journey. We started with the MI50 to get back. The MI100 was a performance per dollar leader, let's call it. The MI200 family was targeted for leadership performance in HPC. And that's exactly what it achieved inside of Frontier. And the next generation, you know, the MI300 that we've talked about is aiming for that leadership performance in the world of AI. But what we've seen from customers is, you know, the, the data center is under duress. You know, it's stressing the capabilities. You know, most every data center customer I talk to, they want to deploy AI. They know they need to get AI into their business operation side to better their business, better their outcomes. But a lot of them are stuck. They're, they have no space left or they're out of power or both or, or cooling. And so, you know, one of the problems that we see with a lot of, especially on the enterprise side is how do they adapt to bring AI into their data centers when they're already stuffed full? And, you know, so if you, if you look at the changing workloads and they're already capped, where are they gonna be tomorrow, you know, when this happens? And this is where, you know, with, with Epic, we we're trying to deliver a, a major disruption so that customers can bring AI into their data centers um, because we believe firmly that most of their space for innovation, they already have it, they just need to reallocate it. And so, you know, we're driving efficiency then really from, you know, from a sustainability, capacity creation, capacity demand accelerating. So we're trying to help customers create um, space in their data center by driving new levels of efficiency they've never seen before. And this is, you know, some of the software tools that um, Chuck and Jason will talk about, we'll, we'll get through that. And so this whole belief of creating capacity through energy efficient consolidation, no more, no, no more in time has VMware and the consolidation message been true. The best way to go create space in your data center is take out those five, six year old servers, consolidate it down five to one, create space, cooling capacity, energy capacity, so they can go deploy AI. And so when we look at, you know, the data center today, we look at, you know, this, the space for your IT innovation, it's there. Even though you may be topped out, you may be capped out. Um, but if you look at kind of the, these ratios of some of these older Skylake or Cascade Lake servers, 
You know, you can go anywhere from five to six to seven to one kind of consolidation and free up, you know, 70 to 60 to 70 percent of your racks. You can save, you know, 50 to 65 percent on power. You can shrink your footprint down and create that space. And that's what AMD with Epic brings to the enterprises, create that, that capacity so you can go bring AI in. A quick question on, yeah. the, um, on the less power here. Uh, is, is this less power at high, at peak load on the processor? We're doing apples to apples here. So we're, we're trying to do as fair a compare. Okay. And the, the normal way we do it is like using VMark as the, as the measuring tool. You know, take a VM mark on like a Sky Lake or a Cascade Lake, and then, and I think Chuck and Jason are going to walk through some of the live demos that we did during launch were actually pure VM mark kind of comparisons. Okay, and I assume that these are variable speed processors, just like everything else. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another another question on this: um, Can you talk about the cooling of the future? There's a lot of debate around water cooling and specifically what's going to be needed in the future around GPUs and the high-end processors. This is something that is stressing hyperscalers and customers all over the place. Yeah, so, so I would say we're, you know, and I'll use as an example, we're, we're pretty unique in our position right now. If you look at the AMD stack, we have like, you know, 18 Genoa SKUs. I think the other guys have like 60. So one, we're reducing the complexity way down. Um, we do not have any SKUs in our stack that require liquid cooling. We have zero. So you can air cool everything in the AMD stack with air cooling. Now, depending on the density that you're driving, if you're trying to drive, you know, a 1U 400 watt, you may have to use LAC or liquid assisted air cooling to, to get that out. But we don't have any, any SKUs that require liquid cooling. And we've been working with industry partners where, you know, we don't see, at least on the CPU front, um, we don't see a horizon just yet where we're going to be kicked into, you know, the, uh, the liquid cooling stage with CPUs. GPUs are a different story. They're pushing much higher TDPs. Um, but on Epic, getting back to Epic, and then I'll cover Instinct, you know, on Epic, we are supporting um, direct liquid cold plates. So if you look inside of Frontier, it is a liquid cold system, not because it needs to, but because it's so compacted down. I mean, Frontier is pushing 150, 250 kilowatts of rack. You cannot push enough air through a rack. You know, now granted the Frontier rack, I think is about two racks, um, but it's still pushing 150, 300 K when you look at the whole, whole rack. Um, and so that is direct liquid cold plate technology in there. Um, we've done a lot of exhaustive studies on immersion technology. Um, immersion looks good on paper, uh, but in practice it's, not been so good. Um, if you look at some of the, you know, if you take the two different approaches, you've got single phase immersion, which is your typical oil kind of based, and then you have your two phase. Most of the governments in the world just the banned or eliminated the, the two phase, most I would say, um, because uh, they're what they call a forever fluid. Um, and they're, they're hard to contain, they turn into gas, they escape. So they've been banned by most governments in the world um, have, have banned that. Now on the, the flip side though, on you know, oil-based immersion, um, you run into a TDP limit because if you don't get good, just like if you don't have good airflow through a server, if you don't have good oil flow through your server, you're really gonna leave trapped hot spots. And so if you wanna really push the TDP on, on the single phase oil, you actually have to start putting um, pumps and diverters to make the, air, the, the oil flow through the server. And it doesn't help that much on the high TDP. The highest TDP solutions that we know we can push are with direct liquid cold plate um, because we can design, optimize the intake fluid temperature. Um, everything can be optimized around that. And the other thing that we've already found um, in our, some of our competitors have already found too in the immersion fluid case is when you start to do immersion fluid up at around uh, 50 gigahertz or so, think about you know PCI gen, six or something like that, 64 gig, 128 gig thirties, um, the fluids actually start to degrade the SI on the board. So there's a real challenge thinking about, I'm gonna take a 120, you know, a 112 gig thirties or a 224, dunk it in a tank. Um, next thing you know, we, we've got SI degradation problems happening due to the capacitance of, of the fluid. 
And so it's going to be real challenging how to go forward um, with fluids, but there's really some good uses for fluid that I, I have customers that I talk to. Like if your corporate goal is 100% heat capture, that's your whole corporate goal. You know, immersion fluid, immersion is just fine. They're not pushing high TDP. But if you're pushing high TDP and high performance, it may, may not get you where you need to go. And that's where the DLC, with DLC, we know we can push, you know, technology wise, we know with DLC, we can push way behind five, six, seven, eight hundred 800 watts easily with DLC. So that is gonna be a challenge for most data centers though, as they go with fluid or think about fluids. So oh, that made me think about the other side of it. And I know some of the massive, massive data centers have started doing a lot with just um, not using cooling, like they're using just ambient air um, and, and just flowing the air through the building mm -hmm. appropriately. And they're saving on cooling costs by not actually cooling. So I'm curious, looking at the other side of it, um, what, what you guys may be thinking about there. On the data center side? Yeah. So in fact, well, I, in fact, right be, before I, I came here, I went and did a, a two hour tour with Switch. Okay. You know, leading great. If you ever get a chance, go through, you can see some real innovation on data center, power and cooling, the way they bring it in, the way they pump it down, the way they're designing the center to be basically a hot containment aisle, to the way they do the plenum at the top of the building. But it's a complete end-to-end -end system architecture review of how to do heat transfer and capture. Um, you know, and, and Switch has done a, a fabulous job on that front. Um, I do think, you know, with air cooling, you know, we'll, we'll probably be able to push traditional at scale volume air cooling, probably 75 kilowatts is probably at the fringe, probably. But, you know, every time we say we're at the fringe, we find a way <laughs> to do more. Um, and so, you know, the, the last thing I was going to comment, and then we'll go back to, to the question here is, you know, in our architecture, because we have a chiplet based architecture, we get a natural benefit of we spread the heat out. So we don't have this large monolithic die that creates this sunspot like temperatures. So we spread the heat out just by design. This is why one of the reasons why we have no pins in our stack that actually require it. Like I said, we support it, but we don't have any that require it. This is actually Bergamo. So this is 128 cores. And this one with the 12 is, is Genoa, uh, Genoa X, which has got the large stack cache. But these are both electrically compatible, socket compatible, platform compatible. Um, so I know there was a question. So on the <coughs> side of the cooling conversation, there's the power conversation. So we heard the hero numbers about HPC, but what's more practical is AI, AI use cases where we're talking NVIDIA GPUs or AMD GPUs, they are power hungry. So the problem that we're facing in the data center that we don't even get to fill up a rack because one server can use a whole rack worth of power. How are people thinking, you know, if, uh, using the competitors GPU, eight of them will take up 5.6 kilowatts of power, mm -hmm. which in a typical Equinix data center, et cetera, that's usually my power allow allowance for a rack. That's in one server. So how are we rethinking AI, the implications on AI, and not just data center design, but retrofitting our legacy data centers that are not designed to take that much power into the rack to actually utilize any of this efficiency. Because if I if I can't put this if I can't put more than one server in the rack, what's the right. what's the point of the efficiency? Yeah, I mean you're you're right. There there's a whole range of data center types out there, right. especially if you go to Asia and you you know they may be two four kilowatt rack. Um, North America, I would say on average is probably more in that eight to 12. And then you've got some of the FSIs, the banking guys that are probably pushing more 15, 18, and the MDCs can push a little higher. But most everybody, I would say, in enterprise and normal cloud are staying with air cooling as long as they possibly can. Now, the, the challenge for the enterprise is going to be exactly what you said, is does the data center become a deterrent to their next generation business proposition. So they're either going to, you know, design and improve their data centers, or are they going to go to a colo, or are they can go to a cloud. Um, but one thing's for sure is they can't just ignore it um, because of you know the the business value that that gets created with with AI. Um, 
I mean, we're we are definitely driving the performance per watt, um, you know, up. So we're we're becoming much much more efficient, but it is at higher power. Um, but we are providing more performance than we are taking up in power. So, um, you know, we could go the the other way, but I don't think people will like the performance or the TCO if we go the other way and and start driving the other direction. So everybody wants more more performance. Um, so I guess getting back to your, your question, Keith, is I think um, you know many data center operators are having a moment where they have to f reflect on, do they stay on-prem? Do they go to a colo, like a switch, um, where they're pushing, you know, switch certainly supports more, more rack power than, than most data center off-prem enterprise or most off-prem enterprises. Or do they do their AI journey and start in the cloud? Um, I guess the time time will tell on on that. Can you can you touch a little bit on lower powered and uh, ARM? Obviously, you just filed for IPO, and ARM is uh, becoming more of a competitor in the space as well. It's not just Intel, AMD, and Nvidia. Yeah, I, I, I can't comment on their IPO, um, but I mean ARM is a you know formal competitor that we're certainly paying attention to. Um, if you look at our Bergamo design, you know, our Zen 4C design, it was targeted at a different class of performance per watt efficiency. Um, but we're taking a different track than, you know, our competitors. You know, if you look at our Zen 4C versus our Zen 4, it's essentially, um, the best way to describe it is it's the same C code with a different compiler optimization flag. And we're basically saying, to take the design point, move down the VF curve to a more efficient point on that, which means transistor size and density changes. But that means we give up top line frequency. But so we move it down that, that graph and then we can pack it more in and then we cut the cache in half. And the reason for that is we were optimizing Bergamo for cloud native, which if you look at cloud native applications versus legacy, they have a drastically different data locality requirement. You think about an old monolithic application that's doing a lot of shared memory a lot of shared memory um, sharing of data through the last level caches, you know, in a large multi-threaded big iron, you know, kind of application. Now you fast forward to the cloud native world where every, every, you know, instance or container or function is a write once run anywhere. All the data sharing, locality sharing is through messaging through ethernet. So they don't have that huge data locality requirement as a large legacy kind of database or legacy application. So we optimized for that, for cloud native and kind of function as a service, realizing that the data locality changes. So we were able to, that was one of the rationales that um, led us to the, you know, we could reduce the cache and it's real, really good for those applications. So kind of dense virtualization, containers, functions, Bergamo is really good for. Uh, but getting back to, you know, the ARM front, if you look at, the only thing we can compare on ARM is, you know, what they publish and what they benchmark and what we can benchmark with what we can buy. Um, if you go to like Spec Power and you look at the Bergamo versus, I think there's one or two submissions for, for Ampere's 128 core. It's about 3x, I don't know, I think it, it might be 3x behind in terms of performance per watt. Um, I mean, we're idling at like, when we're at like 15, 20% load, we're delivering just as many SSJ ops as they are at full load. So, I mean, it's a different design point, right? They designed for here and they can only scale up so far. We have a different design point. Um, so it's a formidable competitor. So we, we are definitely paying attention to and are optimizing our designs um, to make sure that we have the best parts our customers want. Any more questions or we will move on. So. You know, the other thing that helps customers get to their AI journey is performance. So I can probably skip this because we've talked about it. <clears throat> but to us, this is critical to enable that consolidation. If you don't enable the performance, you can't consolidate, you can't create space, you can't save power, you can't create room in your data center. And if we look at, you know, the, uh, the, the range of, of performance looking at, you know, our current, you know, Milan, the 7763 to the competitors uh, top of stack to our Genoa top of stack. You know, on integer, we're almost not quite 2X, 1.8X on spec N. That's pretty good, right? That's a big, big difference. On the enterprise, you know, Java, like I said, on the SSJ ops, 
you know, we're delivering a considerable amount more of SSJ ops um, versus the comp. So again, you can consolidate down more. You know, VM mark, you know, almost, you know, 1.7, 1.73 kind of X density wise. And then on the, you know, on SAP benchmarks, again, almost 2X. So this is that consolidation message. So if you're, think if you're on Cascade Lake or you're on Sky Lake, yes, you could upgrade to, you know, you could stay with the other guys or you could go with us and get another leap in consolidation that you won't get. And that's the point of creating space and capacity in the data center. And that, that kind of shows here when we're looking at our, our top of stack, um, you know, 9654 versus the top of stack competitor, you know, just looking at, you know, how many spec ints that these, if you're looking for 10,000 spec ints, this is just the back of the envelope math of how many servers you need from one versus the other, how much power the two draw. So a significant advantage in consolidating those older servers, you know, over to, to Epic versus choosing their new one. Um, the other thing that, you know, we are, we're worried about on the CPUs, CPUs are great for inference. They've been used for inference for a long time. Um, but inference is all about the entire AI pipeline. You know, somewhere in the middle of all this, you know, if you, if you look at the AI pipeline of I've got some input, I've got to load a model, I've got to normalize the data, I've got to do something to it before I throw it into the model. Um, I throw it in there, I process it, I get the result, I've got to sort it, I've got to figure out is it within the distribution of range and bounds, and then I make a business decision. Somewhere in the middle in here is a, is a little bit of matrix multiply. When you look at it end to end, now if you do a benchmark that's just matrix multiply, um, you'll get a different answer. But if you look at the true end to end nature of of inference, you know you come up with a different different result because, you know, the real nature of of AI that we all deal with is it's got to be an end to end problem. I think one of the best papers I read was a a, a study done on the impact of inference of taking a picture. Think about your phone, real world example. Take a picture on your phone, you send it to the cloud, you want the cloud to tell you what it is, is it a cat or a dog. So you take a picture, you upload it. It's got to take that data, it's got to swizzle it around a little bit, load the model, decide if it's a cat or dog, and then communicate it back to you. Over two thirds of that time is data transmission. Over two thirds is just the data transmission. The whole other third is that in the middle. And somewhere in that one third is matrix math. And so, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I always talk about, so if you, if you take the, um, if you take that example, and if you make that 30%, you know, zero, you only sped it up 1.3x, period. I mean, Amdahl's law is live and well. Um, I mean, you, you can't break the bounds of, of physics on the transmission side. So we're really focused on the end-to-end, -end, which is why we've been really focusing on TPCX AI, which is more of an end-to-end -end benchmark. And when you look at the whole end-to-end -end pipeline, and this is where the competitors have their, their AMX, you know, we still come out way out ahead because we have such a performance leadership when you look end-to-end. -end. Yes, sir. Can you, can you comment, uh, you comment here about Intel versus AMD, but one of the challenges, and we obviously have VM Explore, is around migrating from Intel to AMD and EVC and having to shut down VMs and customers don't really enjoy that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I would love to, but I'm going to hold my tongue um, because <laughs> Chuck and Jason are going to cover that exact question, um, you know, in their section after this. So we are right. absolutely right. aware and are working on making that easy for customers. Um, so we'll defer that. And if they don't answer your questions, they're even going to show a live demo, um, you know, of getting crossing architecture boundaries. So the other thing, and this gets to the point of, of normally this is where I'd talk about, we're trying to make it easy. We have this cool tool called Vamped. Jason and Chuck are gonna talk about. So we've gotta make it easy, right? To get that energy efficient performance, the easy migration, to simplify the consolidation, simplifying the OPN stack. Less SKUs is less complex. Um, so we're trying to make it easy for customers. And then lastly, you know, to really lead and to help on the AI front is driving innovation. So this is where we've been driving leadership chiplets, performance in Epic, you know, being compatible, x86 helps the easy software ecosystem. And then we've got the AI um, instinct accelerators that are coming along 
that will provide some, you know, much, uh, you know, a, a very performant um, accelerators in the in the AI GPU space. And so again, you know, we've got these chiplets where we've been mixing and matching, as you see in the parts that that you've got in front of you. This has enabled us to do all kinds of optimized things. <laughs> And, you know, moving forward, you know, we did what we did with Genoa X is we took the same technology and we started to do 3D stacking on Genoa X to get the large cache. Well, we learned how to do 3D stacking on Genoa X so that we could also go apply 3D stacking to some of our Instinct products. And so it gives us a great interconnect power, interconnect density. It's very energy efficient in terms of stacking and integrating. I mean, the one thing that we know in, in terms of technology is Net, net overall, you know, integration deeper generally, I would say generally, is the right answer for better performance and better energy efficiency. Not always, but generally speaking, it's always been the answer. Um, all of our phones, you know, on your desk are great examples of deeper integration. Um, those would not, anybody remember the old Nokia or the old, you know, Samsung or the old Motorola phones? You know, there were a couple of bananas uh, size. Those were big. Um, and so, you know, I've already talked through a lot of this. I'm going to try and speed up. So, you know, at AMD, we're trying to optimize the portfolio. We've got Genoa. Then we take Genoa X, same building blocks, stack on some extra cash on top of the cores. We get Genoa X. We take the same design principles and, and, and target a different design point and physical implementation. And we get Bergamo at 128 cores. We take the same building blocks of IO and CCDs and we shrink it down yet further and we come out with Sienna, Sienna, which is coming out later this year, which is really targeted more at the edge, telco, storage, embedded space. Um, we'll probably find a home in many servers as well because it's gonna be super power efficient because we've shrunk it down um, you know, with that. And then we added, you know, we, we've talked about publicly the MI300X, 300A, sorry. This was the world's first APU. So this is where we bring those instinct cores and those x86 cores and unify them on, on a 3D stack. So now, no more do you have to transfer data between the CPU and the GPU. You've got that low latency interconnect. You've got the easy programming model. I'm passing pointers now instead of passing buffers. Um, much more energy efficient, much higher performance with tons of memory bandwidth in terms of, of memory capacity. And then, you know, the... The, the 300X is aiming for that generative, uh, aiming for that AI um, leadership. And the big differentiators that we have is we have a lot more HBM density and we have a lot of HBM bandwidth um, that are, we think are gonna be differentiations in these large language models to drive that next wave of compute. And then, you know, kind of the last step, if you wanna be performant and you wanna drive the data center the next wave, you've gotta execute. We've got to execute on time. We've got to meet our promises. We've got to innovate on time. You know, delays, many companies make decisions and then have delays because of someone's execution or whatnot. Um, in this market right now, you can't afford any execution mishaps. This is the difference between a business pull, rolling out a new service and the competitor rolling out a new service. And so at, at AMD, we've been really focus on you know, clean swim lanes between our DPU, GPU, and CPU, and execution. You know, so we're, we've executed on four generations of, of Epic. You know, the fifth generation, I can happily say, is on track. The GPU started a little later, so it's the same kind of crawl, walk, run, 100, get back in, 200 HPC performance, 300 you know, AI performance. And you know, we acquired Consando, which is the most prevalent um, DPU, I guess I would say, in the market outside of one of the public cloud providers, you know, AWS Nitro has their own in-house. But outside of that, Pensando is, you know, shipping in more clouds and more enterprises than anybody else, you know, in the market. And that team is a, a phenomenal team. If you've ever met with the, uh, the MPLS team of, uh, of Prim Jans, an incredible team. So happy to have them as part of the AMD family. Um, but what I want to then is, is really just pass it off to Jason and Chuck, and they're going to answer your question about migration and go through a demo and show all the, all the things they've been up to. We've been on, I think we're on our second generation of, of what we call VAMPT, a VMware architecture migration tool. 
We actually collaborated with VMware on this, architected it, and co-developed. Um, and it's free. It's actually on the VMware Marketplace. Um, it's open source. It plugs right into your existing tooling, so you can roll it into your existing infrastructure and your DevOps, however you do it. Um, and so I'll turn it over to these guys to uh, to do that. Good questions on the execution side of it. The one, are you, is, is AMD building any of their own plants yet, or fab plants, or are they still utilizing third party? Right now, we are, um, I'm not a, well, I'll just say we, you know, we uh, have optionality to use all the leading foundries. So, you know, TSMC, Global Foundry, Samsung. So we have the optionality to use all three, and we did. Okay. And so that's how you're staying ahead of supply chain, by just using the three plants instead? I mean, right now they have leadership and capabilities and, and process and packaging. Um, it served AMD very well. Um, we've got some other, you know, if you look at some of the other customers of those, of those foundries, there's some pretty big customers that are pushing them pretty hard mm -hmm. to stay on track. And so we like, we like where we are in that space. Okay. Is there any um, OEMs that are leaning in heavier with AMD? Um, you know, I think that, you know, if you just look at the normal kind of, you know, Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm adoption curve, if you look at that normal, normal curve, right, it's, it's the early adopters, the tech innovators that just get it, right? They care about technology and performance. You know, we've won a lot of them, right? Almost all the public cloud vendors are using Epic. We won Frontier, they get the first Exascale machine. Um, we're in Tesla. Um, so we've got those early adopters. And if, you, if you've read the book, right, you know about the early majority, late majority, the enterprise moves slower. They're risk adverse. Um, they need tooling. They need help like this architecture migration tool. So we are making great strides in the, the enterprise with all the OEMs. Um, but it's a different, you know, the, the other side of that crossing the chasm, they care about solutions and convenience, right? So it's got to be, be more than just tech and performance. And so that's why we're working on tooling and partnering with like VMware to make it easy to get to those, that convenience and solutions. Um, but yeah, I, I would say all the, you know, we're doing well, you know, all the OEMs have AMD in their portfolios now um, and, are, and we're continuing to grow in the enterprise.